Today, we're gonna to talk about three ways to edit the Milky Way from the super quick and easy Lightroom method all the way up to the astrophotographer approach, which takes much longer. <laughs> Stick around to the end to see the Milky Way edited in a way that I'm sure you've never seen before. To start out here, I'm just using a single exposure shot from a night in Colorado two years ago. I used a shutter speed of 13 seconds and f1.4 aperture and ISO 640. The reason why my ISO was so low is that my camera's ISO invariant, meaning that I can change the gain of my exposure in post or in the field and it kind of makes no difference in terms of how much noise that produces. The first thing I'm going to do for this edit is I'm just going to boost the exposure and bring all the data to kind of the center of the histogram without clipping. Next, I'm gonna fix the color balance issues in this image by taking a look at my histogram and adjusting the red, green, and blue channels using the temperature and tint sliders. By aligning those channels, I get the grayest sky possible, which is a really nice neutral starting point for my Milky Way edit. Then I'm just gonna go through the regular edits that you would do in Lightroom and bring a little bit of contrast into the image. And I'm gonna boost the vibrance and saturation a tiny bit too. Now the new Lightroom Classic has a new masking tool in it that makes it super easy to separate the sky and the foreground. So you can just click on these buttons here and you'll have a separate mask for the sky and foreground. I'm just gonna boost the exposure a tiny bit for the foreground and maybe a little bit for the sky, but not quite as much. And here I can play around with the color balance again. Another thing I'm going to do for the sky is use the dehaze tool to add a little bit of contrast into the nebulosity in this image. As you go through each of these edits, you can keep an eye on your histogram and make sure that your red, green, and blue channels are pretty well balanced if you're looking for a more neutral and natural looking Milky Way image. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is head over to the detail tab and make sure that my sharpening is not applying to the whole image. You can do that by holding Alt and dragging the masking slider to see what parts are being affected. The white shows which parts are being affected by sharpening, and you don't want it to be affecting anything but hard edges like the edges of the mountains and the star shapes. Otherwise, you're enhancing the noise that's in between the stars. Next, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit and add noise reduction, not too much to where it completely destroys all the detail and check in on this color noise reduction to make sure that's not removing all of our star colors. You can see if I slide it all the way up, our stars become pure white and we don't want that. We wanna retain some of that star color. So for my preferences in a single exposure shot, this is about as far as I would go. Next, I'm gonna show you what you can do if you add Photoshop to the mix. For stage two, by adding Photoshop, it unlocks the ability to use multiple exposures. And with astrophotography, since we're pushing our cameras to the limits, it's really helpful to use separate exposures for the sky and the foreground, and using tools like stacking images to add a lot more data to one image. So for this example, I put my camera on a star tracker, and that allows me to get exposures up to two, three minutes long, without getting any streaking in the stars from the Earth's rotation. Typically, you'd wanna use the same exposure time for all your shots, but I wanted to use this as an example to show you how to match exposures between many shots in just one click in Lightroom. So just select all the images that you wanna use for your stack, and then hit up to settings and match total exposures, and Lightroom will normalize the exposures between all of those images so that when you stack them, they have the same exposure. Now that I have all of my images matching, I'm gonna open them up as layers in Photoshop. You can do that by selecting them, hitting edit in, and open as layers in Photoshop. Now I'm gonna select all my layers by going Control Shift A, and go up to edit, auto align layers, hit okay. This is gonna line up all the stars in each image so that when I blend them all into one image, we don't get any blurring or weird artifacts from the stars not being fully aligned. And the last step to stacking them is going over to layer, smart objects, stack mode, and then you can use median or mean, I'm gonna use median. Just zooming in to take a closer look. This is an unstacked image versus a stacked image. As you can see, the space in between the stars has a lot less noise, and also objects like satellites or planes flying through your image are taken out automatically. Now the next little trick in Photoshop that I like to use is star minimization. And you can do this by creating a copy of your layer by Alt and dragging that layer up. Then head over to Select, Color Range, and then change the selection to Highlights. Bring the range to a high luminosity here so that we're just getting those bright stars and play around with the fuzziness and hit okay. Now you can zoom in and see how many of your stars you selected. And you can play around with that fuzziness setting and the range setting to select more or less stars. It just depends on your preferences here. Now the next step is gonna be heading over to select, modify and expand. And you can go by two, three pixels, it's up to you. 
and then select modify and feather and just do half of whatever that first value was. So 1.5 for me. That's just gonna ease the transition between the selection of the stars and the background sky. And the last step for star minimization is filter other and go to minimum. Make sure you have preserve roundness selected and then you can play with the radius. Um, if you have the preview toggled on, you'll be able to see how it affects the image. Typically, I won't do any more than one pixel and I'm just gonna do 0.7 pixels for this example but you can try different values here now zooming out you're going to be able to see how that affected our picture this is before and this is after so as you can see it brought out a lot of that nebulosity in the background by decluttering the image of those bright stars if you want to bring back some of the stars without repeating that process all over again you can just drop the opacity just a little bit and make it look somewhat more natural again this is all very subjective now the last thing i like to add in photoshop is a high pass filter to add just a little bit of contrast to the nebulosity of the core there so i'm going to hit Control alt shift e to stamp that sky layer then i'm going to go to filter other high pass and you can play around with this value here until you get the selection that you want on the nebulosity. As you can see, if you go with a low value, it'll highlight more of those intricate wavy parts of the Milky Way. Uh, but I like going for a larger selection on this since it gives the core more shape rather than the smaller texture things. And I think it just looks weird when you do the smaller textures. So this is something to play around with and it's purely subjective. Now the last step here is just change your blend mode to overlay and let me show you the difference. This is before and after. So as you can see it brought a lot of shape in and once again I'm just going to lower the opacity on that just a little bit to make it less of a harsh effect. Now if you're happy with how your image is looking so far you can stamp these layers by Control alt shift e and then convert that layer to a smart object. From here, I'm going to go Control shift a to open up my camera raw filter, which is essentially the same thing as using Lightroom to edit your photos. Once again, I'm going to boost my exposure to somewhere more reasonable in the center here. And then I'm going to adjust my temperature to get that color balanced a little better. Next, you can play around with dehaze and all the sliders in the middle here to get it looking just how you want it. The last thing I need to do is just bring the foreground layer in. Back in Lightroom, I'm going to use this four minute long exposure and I'm going to copy it into my main composition here, move it into the right place, roughly the right place. And another quick tip for expanding your canvas size is just using the crop tool. Make sure you don't have delete crop pixels enabled but you can just stretch out your canvas size without having to try to guess what the size should be. I'm actually gonna rasterize this layer because I don't really need it to be a smart object right now. And what I'm gonna do for the sky is just use the quick selection tool and select that sky out and then control shift I to invert my selection and add a mask. And now I can move my foreground so that it's more appropriately placed. I've just noticed that there's a weird line that didn't get selected out on the foreground here. So I'm gonna use the brush tool by hitting B, make sure my mask is selected and you can paint this away if you have a black brush enabled. So now I can hit Control S to save it and it'll save in Lightroom and I can do some final tweaks like adding a vignette, adding a little bit more color, etc. If you're finding this video interesting, make sure to hit the like button down below so that you can let YouTube know to show this video to other people. Thanks. The last workflow uses Astro Pixel Processor, then PixInsight, then Photoshop and finishing up in Lightroom. The reason why I use programs like Astro Pixel Processor and PixInsight is that they're astrophotography specific software that allows you to use calibration frames and work with linear files. And what I mean by calibrate is correct for vignetting and also correct for hot pixels. Hot pixels are the little red and green and blue dots that you might see on your sensor after you take long exposure shot. And those actually don't change from shot to shot very much. So you can shoot with your lens cap on for the same duration of your exposure time to kind of map out where those red, green, and blues are and then effectively remove them by subtracting that frame from your light frame. So I'm here in Astro Pixel Processor where I have just one of the frames opened up. Right now our image is in a linear state and I'll tell you a little bit more about what a linear image is versus a stretched image a little bit later in the process. I've just calibrated this image by hitting the calibrate button and it's linked my calibration frames to the light frame and when I hit the calibrated view, 
you'll see that a lot of these red, green, and blue pixels completely disappear. After I've done my calibration in Astro Pixel Processor, I'll do the regular stacking just like I did in Photoshop, although you don't have to do all the auto aligning and the changing of blend modes. All you do is hit integrate. It'll automatically execute all of those steps for you and you'll be left with a fits file, which is a 32-bit linear file. Now I'm in PixInsight and I want to show you what a linear file is. So just taking a look at this image right now, it looks really dark and black and can just barely see some of the Milky Way core and some of the stars peeking through. But if we take a look at the histogram, all of our data is on the left side of the histogram. And that's because this image hasn't yet been stretched. So when the camera took the image and recorded the data, it didn't do that translation of that data, stretching it out on the histogram and making it look like what a human eye could see. So that's something that we get to do on our own in PixInsight, and that way we can make more precise decisions about how we want to interpret the data that the camera captured. But before I do the stretch, I can press this button here, which does an auto stretch, and it kind of just gives me a preview without actually affecting the data. Now that I've cropped my image, I'm gonna do a dynamic background extraction, which is where you sample different parts of the background sky and the program makes a map of any gradients that are in the sky. So that could be light pollution or air glow. So as you can see here on the left side, this is the map of the gradients in the image. And towards the bottom left corner, you can see there was maybe a little bit of light pollution or air glow going on. And so in the right image, you can see it's just a flat gray background more so. And just doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the corrected image to the non-corrected image, you can already tell that the Milky Way is popping quite a bit more. Now the next step I'm gonna do is select out parts of the background and select the core itself and do some color calibration to make sure that all my colors are as accurate as possible. And the last tool that I use is SCNR and that just removes a little bit of the green tint. Just a quick reminder, this whole time the image still hasn't actually been stretched. So if I remove the auto stretch, it's still this really dark image. The last step I'm gonna do before I stretch is I'm going to remove all the stars from the image using Star Exterminator, which is a plugin that I use in PixInsight. The reason why I like removing the stars in my image before I stretch it is because stars are pinpoints of really bright light compared to the really dim nebulosity in the background. So in order to stretch both appropriately, it's better to stretch them separately and then reincorporate them rather than try to stretch it all at once and have a super high dynamic range in the scene that you're trying to stretch all at once. Next, I'm gonna stretch the image using Arcs and Stretch. It's a tool that was designed to preserve the highlights of the image. Now I'm all done in PixInsight. I'm gonna bring these two images separately into Photoshop as layers to combine them and then blend them with the foreground. Back in Photoshop here and I have both layers open. The way to bring the stars back into the background sky is just changing the blend mode to either screen or you can use linear dodge add. From here on out, I would just do the same workflow that I did in stage two with Photoshop. Maybe do a little bit of star minimization, but do it to the stars only layer. And that way you don't get the kind of haloing that you would with the original workflow that doesn't separate the stars to their own layer. Then just blend in the foreground. With this workflow, I don't really need to use the high pass filter as much because using the techniques I did already brings out that nebulosity a lot. Now let's take a look at the final results and see what benefits you gain from using the longer workflow. Comparing the unstacked single exposure to the stacked in Photoshop version, you can tell that the single exposure has a lot more noise. And one other thing worth noting is that because you're using single exposure, I had to shoot at f1.4, which isn't the sharpest aperture on my lens. Just comparing the star shapes on the single exposure since I shot wide open at f1.4, this lens is not nearly as sharp at 1.4. So in the f2.8 version that I stacked in Photoshop, you can see the stars are a lot more pinpoint and sharp. Not to mention they don't have any trailing the way that the single exposure does. Aside from that, we just have a lot cleaner image, a lot less noise in the stacked version. In my opinion, the stacking workflow in Photoshop is definitely worth it even for the beginner Milky Way photographer. It allows you to get a lot more quality image out of your maybe limited gear, even if you're shooting without a tracker. Now comparing the image that we edited in Photoshop versus the image that we edited in in astrophotography software before bringing into Photoshop, the main difference you're gonna see is that the Milky Way pops a lot more in the astrophotography version, and that's because we have tools like dynamic background extraction, which remove a lot of the haze and gradients from the image and bring out that deep nebulosity in the image. Also, since we're able to do star removal, we can edit the Milky Way separately from the actual stars and make sure that the stars don't get bloated. So if we look up close on the stars, you can see that since we technically push the exposure 
picture all together, the stars and the background sky on the Photoshop version, a lot of these stars have different color rings around them, and that's not necessarily their star color. For some it is, but for a lot of them, it's chromatic aberration that gets really exaggerated by pushing the exposure. Whereas on the PixInsight version, we're separating the stars out before we push the exposure, meaning we're not bringing out those imperfections in the stars. Another thing is you might see some dark rings around some of the stars in the Photoshop version, and that's from the star minimization technique we used. It's sort of an unavoidable part of using that type of star minimization. Whereas when we have stars on a separate layer and we do star minimization, we don't get that dark ring around them. Aside from that, we also used calibration frames in the astrophotography workflow, which make it a lot cleaner in terms of the hot pixels and any of the bad pixels in there in general. At the end of the day, the effort that I add for the astrophotography workflow is really significant and I would say it takes me on average an hour or two extra to use that workflow. And for me, it's worth it because I produce large quality prints and I like to sell those. So having the utmost quality is really important to me. But if you're just a beginner astrophotographer getting into this as a hobby, the Photoshop workflow is a lot more accessible. You don't have to buy the extra software and it's a lot quicker and you still get really beautiful results, especially if they're being presented on web. Someone on Instagram is not gonna be zooming in that close to your stars to see whether there's chromatic aberration or not. But let me know down in the comments down below which version did you like the best? Would you rather just have a quick and easy edit or is it worth it to spend that extra time and have a really stunning result in the end? Now if you're an editing nerd like I am, you might be interested in this other video I made about how viral TikTokers make their VFX. With that out of the way, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.